Hey everyone, we're going to dive into this interview really quick here. I just wanted to let you know that if you haven't checked out the cardboard cutouts, the video series that we're doing on YouTube, as well as all the other stuff we're doing on YouTube these days, you are missing out. You are going to see some ridiculous, crazy, and hopefully some awesome stuff on there. So please go check out our YouTube channel, Cardboard Herald on YouTube. You can also find all the links on our site, www.cardboardherald.com. So with that out of the way, we're going to get to our conversation with Chris Falkenberry, the awesome, interesting, fascinating, RPG-loving designer of Battle for Baternia by Stone Circle Games, which, by the way, launches on Kickstarter November 7th, 2017. Check that game out. Here is my talk with Chris Falkenberry of Stone Circle Games. Chris, welcome to the Cardboard Herald. I'm so glad to have you here. This must be a really exciting time of the year for you. Yeah, definitely. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, you're right on the verge of having the second Kickstarter launch for your upcoming game, Battle for Baternia. That's coming here in October, right? That's right. Uh, Mid-October is what we're aiming for, but around the 17th is our goal right now. Oh, man, I can't imagine what it's like to, to have the, the built-up anticipation of what that's going to be you know I, personally i can imagine that i'd be quite nervous combined with excited and maybe a, a little bit of an attitude of like you know we're going to kick the butt out of this kickstarter but that's me what, what are you actually feeling like right now well i mean i think that sounds pretty accurate we're uh, we got so close last time that we're hoping to really blow it out of the water this time. Uh, we're pretty excited about that. We've got uh, a few changes, not like not a lot, but a few things we've changed, improved on based on what we heard last time. So we're really looking forward to seeing how this pans out. Well, for the folks who didn't listen to the previous Stone Circle Games interview that we did uh, with Gary and John, how about we kind of go over Battle for Britannia and the the story thus far this is a game that you designed and you're a member of stone circle games right that's absolutely right yeah um so you want me to just go through it from the beginning yeah uh, let's hear it man yeah all right tell me a tale well uh good long time ago when i was in grad school i was playing a lot of league of legends at the time as and uh as with half the people on the planet right and you know uh a friend of mine who I had gotten him to play a little bit, it wasn't really his thing, uh, but he said, you know what, this, this could be a really cool board game. There's not a board game like this yet. And so uh, my buddy, whose name was also Jack, actually, uh, and I started kicking around ideas for this, and we came up with lots of seeds of ideas that didn't really go anywhere. And then we just kind of let it sit. You know, we weren't getting anywhere. We weren't thinking of anything. So we just let it go for, you know, a couple of years. Uh, and we thought about it once in a while, then he had a kid, and he talked to me. He said, you know, I don't, I don't really have time to work on this now. You know, i got a kid. i got a lot going on. Uh, so if you want, you know, to do what you can with the idea, it's all yours. You Go go ahead. Because until that point, you know, it had been kind of collaborative. Um, and at that point, I actually sat down with another friend of mine. His name's also Chris. So there's a total of two <laughs> names in this story so far. Um, and, you know, we talked about ideas for the game and, you know, his new perspective uh, that he brought in, too, helped me come up with a uh, sort of miniature-based game with this cool like time track idea from Red November where anything you did would take some time, and it was your turn if you were the furthest back on the time track. It took forever to play. We played like a two-player game with two heroes. It took us like two hours to get one kill in. It was, it was lots of cool ideas, but did not work at all. So we threw that out. Uh, we threw that out entirely, and then we got to the iteration that we know and love today, where we said, you know what, let's pare this way down. Let's look, focus on what's really cool about a MOBA, which to me is getting to customize your hero and level them up and you know, try to outthink and outmaneuver the other player. Mm -hmm. So we really focused in on that. Uh, we came up with that. Uh, at this point, it was, it was kind of mostly me... Uh, because he also, people tend to get busy, and he also became busy and wasn't really able to, to do that much anymore, but he was of huge help as well. But anyway, uh, you know, then we came up with the current set of rules and started testing them, and it turned out that, hey, this was a lot of fun. And, you know, we refined it down, came up with more heroes, and 
ended up with uh, what you see today. And uh, the general idea here, Battle for Baternia, is it is a tabletop MOBA set in a pixelated universe that harkens back to sort of those retro Nintendo games of the 90s and such in its aesthetic. But it's a card game where you and your opponent, or opponents, you can also play in teams, uh, try to outthink each other. You play cards secretly that are kind of what each of your the heroes on your team is going to be doing that turn to mimic the fog of war that you'd get in a game like League of Legends or Heroes of the Storm or something. And then uh, you reveal those cards and you do the things on them. And if you've guessed correctly, you're going to have the edge on your opponent. You keep doing that until... Uh, one player or the other wins by taking out the base. Uh, that's that's sort of my couple-minute summary there of the history of Battle for Baternia. Well, there's a little bit more to it as well. I mean, in the Absolutely. interview with Stone Circle, a big part of that discussion was, I guess, the, the support of one another uh, through successes as well as, to be honest, failures and, and uh, picking each other up after that. And Battle for Baternia has been on Kickstarter uh, once right. before, and it wasn't successful at that time. And now you're back for round two, like Little Mac. What do you think happened with the, the first Kickstarter, and why do you think this time it will be different? Absolutely, yeah. I was trying to give you the history that the other guys might not have had for you, but definitely we had a great run at it, and we got about 80% of the way there, but then we uh, we didn't quite make it. There were some issues that people brought up that we could fix, and we've done our best to fix those. Uh, one big one was just, uh, and this is you know one of the harder ones to really fix, was just we don't have that much sort of presence yet. We have we have released one game, uh, also successfully kickstarted. Um, which is Horrible Hex, and another small uh, drinking game, uh, please drink responsibly, called Pirate Kings. <laughs> uh, that was not kickstarted, but that's a, that's a good seller at cons and stuff. So we have those two out, but this one, uh, you know, that's, we still don't have a huge presence out there, so it's just hard to get eyes on the project. But some of the more tangible things that people asked us about, you know, pe- most people really liked the gameplay itself. But we kept hearing, man, I, you know, I really wish there were more characters to pick from. Because one of these, the trademarks of these MOBAs is you have this huge list of characters. Now we had 12, which is a respectable amount. But what we did was we took all the characters that were going to be stretch goals and we made them regular characters in the game. So now there's 16 characters plus our promo crossover character with our friends over at Level 99 Games. Um, so we did that, and we've got new stretch goal characters that are coming, and they're going to be a lot of fun. We've been testing them, got to play with them at Gen Con. Uh, but a couple of other issues we ran into, one of them was uh, the graphic design was a problem, because none of us are professional graphic designers. And we were able to do enough to make the game functional and playable and clear, easy to read, but it wasn't exactly professional looking. And, you know, people called us on that. And so what we've done is we're talking to a number of graphic designers, and we're going to hire one of those to give us a facelift on the game and really make it look like the product that the player, that the backers are going to be getting when they back the game. Um, along those lines, we also, our representation of what you actually get in the box was also not uh, particularly impressive. So we're also going to get their help in sprucing that up a bit. That's such an interesting thing to me because 10 years ago, 15 years ago, having a great game that looked okay was not a problem at all. You know, the the game stood on its own. But right. now there are so many great games to choose from, so you have to be visually stunning and stand uh, apart from all the other games that are available out there, especially with the immense amount of projects and Kickstarter has the funding level or the the backer price level changed at all, or have you guys not even decided that yet? Uh, we've talked about it a bit. Now, I should preface this, that this is not my area of expertise in the company. That's more, uh, more Gary's uh, realm, Gary and John. Mm-hmm. And from what they've told me, we've actually worked on lowering the backer goal or the, the overall goal a little bit because we've looked at some more manufacturers and found some other options that we might be able to do so we'll be able to print the game what we're really shooting for is you know to go past that and be able to offer an even better quality product 
Uh, as far as the the price of the game, we are leaning toward keeping that the same as it was, which uh, was forty nine dollars at the in the old campaign, and that did include shipping in the United States. Well, this is really exciting. I, I think there's a lot of um, cool things that people should be looking out for, and I think hopefully by doing the the interview circuit, my podcast, uh, <laughs> among uh, all the other various podcasts that are on the internet that I'm sure would love to have you, uh, you're definitely going to get some more eyeballs on it. But I also want to know a little bit more about you know who's the, the person behind the game. So uh, sure. th- this is or will be your first published game, right? Uh, This will be my first published commercially available game. Commercially available. Yes. Uh, My day job, I actually work for another game company called uh, Smart Game Systems. And we contract with, typically with businesses or nonprofits, and make uh, generally face-to-face games. I've done a couple of video games, but mostly face-to-face games that are used for training or information or you know, education or depending on their needs. But the quote-unquote serious games, as it were, to, to try and get some kind of content across. So I've made a number of games with them, but the vast majority of those are not available commercially and, or sold as an entertainment game because we do that with a particular company that we're working for. That's fascinating. So what, give me an example of this entirely separate world of, of games that I'm not <laughs> familiar with. Well, we, I can give you a, a real example on that one. One of the first ones we did, we worked with a company called, or a group called Japigo, which was a jo- uh, Johns Hopkins affiliate out of Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And they do maternity care, among other things. They do maternity care in sub-Saharan Africa. And apparently there has been a problem down there with the like the doctors and the nurses and the midwives not communicating very well. And there's sort of a, some cultural barriers that like a, a bit of a hierarchy. The doctors often don't like to listen to the nurses and the midwives, even though many of them are also very well trained, that kind of thing. And just difficulties working together and communicating. So we made a game called maternity clinic. It's a cooperative game in which these medical professionals will actually play as often, so we might have a doctor play like as a midwife in the team, and they have to work together on the sort of hypothetical worst possible day at one of these clinics to make sure that all of the mothers coming in are taken care of and uh, get out of there safely. Uh, it has a little bit of a uh, little bit of ghost stories uh, type mechanics in there, um, maybe a little bit a little bit pandemic-y, but not exactly, mm-hmm. but. Uh, I mean, I actually think it's a lot of fun, and I, I'll, I'll play. I may be biased, but I'll play it. Uh, I've I played it just for fun sometimes. No, no, but, you know, the, this is uh, great. Games are a great way of yeah. conveying sometimes more abstract concepts or or things that are uh, sometimes difficult to talk about. Role play uh, is really kind of the the first step in empathy you know being able to at oh, least yeah. see something from their perspective so is this something you just kind of stumbled into is this something that you very directly set out to do in life this is really interesting stuff man uh thank you uh, and actually i agree with that's a really great way to put it is that it can foster empathy and really help you understand another person's position that's a lot of what we end up doing but you're absolutely right. This is something I just kind of uh, stumbled into, to be honest. Actually, it's uh, that same friend of mine, Jack, who helped me starting out with uh, this game idea, like Paternia. Um, he met my boss at our local game store and got to talking to him. And my boss was like, well, my now boss, rather. He was like, uh, you know, I'm starting this game company. Uh, I'm looking, you know, to make serious games where it was more environmentally focused at the time. We still do a little bit of that, but he was like this kind of thing. Um, would you be interested now? My friend here had just gotten his master's degree in uh, statistics and was off to a very lucrative statistics job doing number things. (laughs) So he couldn't do it. (laughs) Um, but he was like, you know, I I got another friend that designs games. Why don't you talk to him? And the rest is, is history in that regard. You're getting paid for it, but 
you know, <laughs> that it is humanitarian in nature, um, or at least some of it is. And if you're working on the environment, it sounds like uh, you're you're trying to steer your career with a conscience. Is that something that's really important to you, or is it the fact that you're getting an opportunity to get paid for designing games? I mean, it's a little of both, to be honest, because uh, well, a lot of what we do is. It's more of a corporate training kind of thing, which is a little less in the humanitarian sphere, but there is definitely some of that as well. And, you know, it's it's nice to know that, you know, the work we're putting in on some of these games is actively going toward making the world better. Uh, so that that is definitely important. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not like I only want to make serious games as we can see with Battle for Paternia. Yeah. That, that's, that's a purely entertainment game. And, I th- you know, I'm all for let's you know, play a game, have a good time. But I think that they're also a very powerful tool for change. And I'm really lucky and blessed or whatever you want to say to be able to, uh, to be a part of that. Where in the world is Chris Falkenberry? Are you in DC with the rest of the stone circle guys? Or I guess the, uh, the majority maybe I actually, I know you're East coast. Live in DC. Yeah. Okay. I am East coast. Uh, two of us live in DC. I uh, used to be three, but one of them, uh, Move down to Florida. I live in, uh, yeah, right. I live in uh, Raleigh, Durham area of North Carolina. Oh, okay. Quite displaced from the rest of them. Did you grow up in North Carolina? Sure did. Yeah, um, I grew up about two and a half hours east of here. Went to college at uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Go Heels, and um, <laughs> and grad school uh, back east again to East Carolina University. Which actually, uh, you, uh, funny that you mentioned uh, social work offhandedly my master's is in uh counseling so very rather similar thing there and it's it's been weirdly useful uh not like directly but in the way it teaches you to kind of put yourself in other people's shoes uh in making games yeah well you're clearly if you're in the corporate sphere you're having to deal with egos and i mean that in the the best possible sense of the word that you know there there are people who have had to make tough decisions uh in order to uh sustain a business and oftentimes they have to kind of rely on their their own instincts and if you're trying to convince them to open themselves up to other ideas then you need to be able to navigate that conversation. I imagine that a degree in counseling is incredibly useful in um, navigating that space. Yeah, it's one of those things that, like, I don't think about it most of the time, but every once in a while I'll realize, oh, hey, I learned about, that's something I learned about in (laughs) school. Uh, But, you know, that's a great point. Like, a lot of people are very, uh, you know, corporations especially tend to have procedures and place especially larger ones and sort of uh the way they do things and they want to change that and so we have to we have to be able to provide an experience that helps people see that there's different ways of doing stuff that might also be effective so what's the north carolina gaming scene for a north carolina boy growing up and how has that changed (laughs) over time I mean, clearly you you weren't just a, a board gamer. You have a lot of history with uh, video games. Not only is the theme there, but you were pretty intimate with League of Legends. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, what did true. you grow up on? Uh, well, I grew up, uh, like I said, in eastern North Carolina, which is uh, not like a tiny town, but a moderate-sized town called New Bern. Um, there wasn't a whole lot going on, especially tabletop-wise, but we did have a local game store uh, eventually. I played uh, a lot of Magic the Gathering. Oh, yeah. Um, I was actually, when I was a kid, I wasn't allowed to play Dungeons and Dragons because my parents thought I was evil. They bought into the Oh, nice. The hype. Okay. Uh, they, they have since uh, sort of come around and mellowed on that point uh, after I showed them what it really was. But uh, Good so on you, up... Mr. and Mrs. Falkenberry. <laughs> That's right. I ended up, uh, actually, one of my first game design experiences was coming up with my own... RPG system, which was eerily similar to D and D, but so that I could play it with my friends because I didn't have D and D. So I, that was a lot of what I did as far as tabletop. And then you know some uh, some of the more established things like uh, I played a lot. I remember the Omega Virus. Do you do you know this game at all? No, no idea. It's a uh, it's one of those cheesy '90s like electronic talking games. Oh, set okay. in a space station. 
Uh, we got hit by Hurricane Bertha in 1996, I think. We were out of power for a few days. It was, it was not a huge damage thing to us, but we were out of power for a few days, and so I spent a lot of time playing this Omega Virus. And that was one of my formative gaming experiences. You heard it here. Um, <laughs> it was it's a ton of fun. Um, I still have a co- I still have my copy. But you're you're these people in a futuristic space station trying to stop a computer virus that's taken it over and wants to use it to destroy the world. And the most memorable part of this is that the virus will taunt you as you're playing the game. <laughs> like you'll punch in what room you're in and you'll explore it. It'll tell you what you find. And then the virus will be like, you human scum, <laughs> I will stop you 30 minutes until I take over. Oh my god, I got chills. <laughs> yeah, there, no, it's, it's, there are three it's listeners good. right now experiencing PTSD from their, their childhood experience <laughs> with Omega virus. The, then when I went to college, of course, lots more going on. There was a local game store here that was a lot more well-stocked. Obviously, we, we, we had like a community on campus. So I was exposed to sort of modern board games. And now the scene out here is, is fantastic for, uh, for gaming and especially like tabletop gaming. We had a uh, huge Netrunner following for a good while. Um, you know, there's a store Atomic Empire in Durham that's gigantic and great. And, you know, they have events all the time. There's a group of designers that I'm a part of called the Game Designers of North Carolina. There's a lot of uh, there's a fair number of us that have published titles uh, in there as well. So it's great to have those guys being able to like set up playtesting events and get their input. These experienced uh, older hands at the craft, um, you know, it's super valuable. So that's uh, sort of what it's like now. Seems like a, a good. Uh, track there to go along and it's especially cool that you're part of uh, a scene of people who have published designs that was actually something when i went down to uh, dice tower con in florida Mm -hmm. there were many 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 local designers there who had actually published games and uh, i had kind of made friends with andrew burkett of the theris games and so we actually decided hey let's hang out while i'm down in florida you're going to be at the convention i'll come and he was just introducing me to, like, person after person of, like, yeah, I regularly game with this guy. He designed these two games. And this guy, he's getting his game published by WizKids. And then this guy, he's over here. He's designing this. And uh, this couple, this man and wife, they're, you know, working on their third design about to be published on Kickstarter. And it was just like, man, you guys have formed, like, a, a tight collegiate here, uh, which is actually something that endeared me the most about Stone Circle Games is that you guys are this band of brothers that uh, have gotten together in order to help one another out. So how did you enter Stone Circle? Actually, yeah, we, we kind of are because uh, I know two of these guys from college. We had There was another guy who was part of it, but he, was, uh, he got to be uh, too busy with his you know, real work and such and had uh, he still supports us, but couldn't uh, stay in the company. So actually, three of the guys originally, uh, I went to college with these guys, and um, we were at another another of our college buddies. We we're at his wedding, and it was the day after the wedding. We'd all uh, we'd all been you know designing games and stuff and te- playing each other's games, and uh, we were like, you know, uh, we should start a company to sell these games that we've all been working on. We we're like, yeah, that's a great idea, and we started kicking around ideas and right there you know we we came up with it and then uh another of uh one one of my friends aaron the guy that moved to florida uh he brought in john and gary uh because gary was his childhood friend and which weirdly those guys both grew up about i don't know 20 minutes east of where i grew up but i never (laughs) knew him but but yeah he brought in gary and uh and john and uh, John brought in Matt, uh, who is the the final member of the the crew, and w- we also have Will. But Will is one of the college buddies. I don't want to leave anybody out. Sorry, I'm trying to list the whole team. Um, <laughs> they're all going to be listening with bated breath, being like, "He better, right. he better list me, <laughs> or else." Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Will, you're covered in the college buddies section. Anyway, that's how it, that's how we got together, and we, uh, you know, we started off slow and. Then we finally got up steam and did Horrible Hex, and now we're pushing on to an 
even more sort of ambitious, bigger box, more components, more complex game, Battle for Paternia, and we're picking ourselves up after the last Kickstarter and getting ready to do it again. Aside from the publicity side of things, what do the other members of Stone Circle do for you as a designer in order to help you create and uh, deliver a new game? Well, I mean, I'm not the only designer in the group by any means. Uh, of John, course, of uh, course. Yeah, John designed uh, both of our other published games. And but, Aaron and Will also have designs going. So we, we definitely help each other out. But these guys, um, you know, Gary is an amazing product project manager uh, type. He's, he's great at keeping everybody on track, keeping all the balls in the air, that kind of thing. So he's, uh, he's really a driving force there. Matt knows business and... He's he keeps us in that that headspace when we tend to get a little too uh, creative, artsy, game designy uh, in our conversation. He brings us back and he he has the knowledge there. Uh, Will is super well versed in uh, he, like he's a professional uh, video guy. He does editing and that kind of thing, and um, so he's he's made all of the awesome videos that we've had for our campaign and our YouTube channel, which people should check out. Uh, Aaron does, uh, he handles the money and John, uh, John is more of almost like a Jack of all trades. He's got a little more of a business head than I do. So he's able to, uh, do a lot of the contacts and the networking, that kind of thing too. Uh, so yeah, everybody has a part to play, even when it's not your game that's being published at the time. Let's talk about what this game specifically means to you. You know, it's a distillation of a MOBA, a massive online battle game. Uh, what does MOBA even stand for? Does anyone I know? I think it's Multiplayer Online Battle Arena. Battle there Arena, we go. That sounds it, smart. Remember, it's, uh, to be honest, not a very good name for the genre. <laughs> well, it people, doesn't tell you anything. Especially one of, the, one of the chief games is called Dota, and you have MOBA, and for laymen yeah. like me, it's just like, oh my god, I whatever. Just whatever those things are for, for the layman, for me, for you making your pitch to a guy who's not uh, actively playing Heroes of the Storm, League of Legends, Dota... What are the core elements that make up a MOBA, and how did you distill that into uh, a game? You already mentioned some of the characters, but uh, are you going to have multiple characters on a team? Are you running lanes? You know, what is the the chief elements of a MOBA that people need to understand for this? Well, in order to play this particular version, because you know, there's a whole lot going on in these, the general idea is you're, you have two teams, and I'm talking about the video game MOBA at the moment, uh, you know, League of Legends, Heroes of the Storm. You have two teams, you have a base on each end, and each player has a hero that they control, or a champion, or a, well, they all call it something different, a character. Right. That character grows in power as the game goes on. You control this one character, you control how they develop, you can usually buy some equipment for them, but not, not always. That depends on the game. And uh, you run around and try to kill the enemy characters to get more money to, or experience to upgrade better and faster. You also have a stream of mindless minions that runs down three different lanes. And you have towers defending your base. And generally, the minions serve as a buffer for you to take out the enemy defensive towers and eventually make a run on their base and destroy the base. If you do that, you win the game. That is sort of a, a real rough summary of a MOBA. What we wanted to focus on is one, uh, we thought I thought you know the heroes are the most interesting part of this. People really identify with their hero that they love to play. Um, now we, or, or rather, I decided it, it's cool to have you know a team of heroes too. The synergies between them, the combos you can make. So. When you play Battle for Paternia, it's most of the time two teams of four heroes. And it's either, if we played head-to-head, -head, we would each have a team of four that we would control. But if we played 2v2 teams, then you'd have two people on one team, each of whom has two heroes, and the other team same way. So we wanted to preserve, though, that identifying with the hero and guiding their development. So we have sort of a light deck building thing going on where the hero has cards that represent their powers as they level up you add those cards to your hand and then can use them uh, to combat your opponents 
the fog of war is a huge element in a lot of these MOBAs where you're trying to, you can't see necessarily what your opponents are doing. And that hidden information is huge. Like if, if one of their heroes goes missing from the lane that they were in, for example, uh, yeah, that can be a huge thing. Everybody has to be on their guard because they could be coming to, uh, they call it ganking. They can be coming to gank uh, your guys who might be out of position. Uh, and that's really hard to recreate on a board, of course. But we did that through simultaneous card play face down. So you give your heroes an order, and your opponent doesn't know what that order is. You don't know what hero they get, what order they gave their hero. After you do that, everybody gets to move around on the board. So the board position is going to change in between when you give your order and when you execute your order. So you have to anticipate what kind of stuff they're going to be doing. And we really wanted to preserve that too. On the other hand, on the are, other hand, yeah. On the other hand, minions are cool, and um, th- there are other uh, tabletop MOBA style games like Rum and Bones that really focus on the minion aspect, mm-hmm. where they have a bunch of minions running at each other. That's from Cool Mini or not? So of course it's full of cool miniatures. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that 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 was smart of them to focus on that. That game's good and fun but it's very different from ours so your collection would you know you could have a a collection with both of those games and be perfectly happy they fill different holes but we decided to cut or i suppose i decided to cut minions out entirely because uh they just you know we abstracted them into the game because we really wanted to focus on the hero versus hero combat (laughs) it seems like a a dumb question to ask you know (laughs) who is this game for but you know like is this something that you see as a game that uh, is really approachable for people coming off of a head-to-head card game like Magic the Gathering? What's your target market that you're you're trying to tap into here? Well, I think uh, it definitely can appeal to uh, CCG players, collectible card game type players, because... Uh, just the, the ability to make combos and assemble your team differently and customize. Uh, and, and it can appeal to some of these uh, modern, the modern board game crowd as well. I don't think it's going to be, uh, if, if you're really conflict diverse uh, and you're really into like the, the light Euro games and that's your thing, you don't like games with direct conflict. Well, this game is all about direct conflict, so it may not be for you. So again, as an outsider uh, looking at MOBAs, one of the most spectacular things about it is it is it has room for stories to be told out of the game, not just in the, the theme, but in the event of the game itself that you could talk about a, a game that happened a year later and be like, oh man, do you remember that time when? Was it a cognizant decision to you to, to allow for players to come back when you know the other players what's the term on tilt uh you know (laughs) uh when uh you know they're they're on the verge of defeat to to still leave some opportunity for them to to re-enter the game and push back in a meaningful way and if so how hard was it to balance that to make it so it's still fair uh, and not just rubber banding the the losing player back to an even keel. Yeah, that's an excellent question, and uh, that's a complaint I have about a number of like the Euro games where there are catch up mechanisms that seem just kind of forced. Yeah, I like it when they happen organically in the game, and honestly, it's kind of lucky that the one we have worked out as well as it did. Now, of course. I think players should be rewarded for doing well in the game. So it's obviously an advantage. If you get an early lead, that should be an advantage. But it does need to be possible to come back from that, and we do have a couple of ways that that happens. One of those is um, the each hero's ultimate ability, which is achieved when they... You unlock that when you take them to their maximum level, which is level 4 in this game. That Their ultimate abilities are incredibly strong. And so... Even if you're behind, if you unlock a powerful ultimate ability and use it at the right time, you can turn a game around, and I've seen it happen a number of times. Uh, and, and that brings us to this whole, like, how you can have stories of I remember when... And, you know, I've got some great plays that I remember people making uh, when we would demo this at 
conventions and that kind of thing, or when I played it with friends. Um, so there's that. But honestly, the the mechanism I'm the most proud of in this game is the uh, the cooldown system. So often in in MOBA games, you have a suite of abilities, usually like four abilities you can use, and whenever you use one, typically it goes on a cooldown, and there's you have to wait a period of time before you can use it again. Uh, that can get real clunky in a game like this, but the way we did it is when you use your ability, it goes face up in front of your character, but then shortly thereafter, you're going to discard that to a discard pile. You have this deck, it's full of cards that are powers from your various heroes, and also sort of basic generic attacks that anybody can do. Uh, when the deck runs out, because at the end of every turn, you draw some more cards, as you often do in card games. When the deck runs out, you take your discard pile, but unlike a lot of card games, you don't shuffle it. You just turn it back over. And so this gives you a cooldown timer for every ability, because you know pretty much when that ability is going to come through. Now, as you level up your heroes, you have more cards in that deck, which means your cooldowns are getting longer, which is a catch-up mechanism. Because as you're getting further ahead, you have to wait longer and longer to reuse your abilities. Well, I want to switch tracks a little bit and talk about the the look of this game. So it's themed around sure. uh, 90s, 8-bit, 16-bit games. And you're talking about my jam here. You know, I grew <laughs> up as an Alaskan in the, the 90s primarily. I started with an NES and then uh, oh, Super wow. Nintendo. We had a lot of long winters with a lot of long nights. So I spent a lot of time inside playing these <laughs> video games. So how people handle retro style homages and, and themes in video games and board games these days is important to me. What What's your history with video games and when did this become a retro themed game i'll start with the second question originally it was actually supposed to be a league of legends game and we were gonna we were like oh well maybe we can get up with riot and see if they're interested or something and we were just really just kicking around ideas for fun um and you know later i was like well you know that's unlikely that that's going to happen so i would need to you know get uh some kind of theme to it and it just kind of occurred to me as i mentioned before uh Another college buddy of mine runs Level 99 games, who made games like Pixel Tactics and Battlecon. And um, I don't think Pixel Tactics was a direct inspiration on this. In fact, I don't think I'd even seen Pixel Tactics yet. But it has been since. Like, the, the Level 99, you know, me and Brad have talked and bounced ideas around. So there's been some influence there. But uh, I, I, honestly, I think I was thinking about 8-bit theater, you know, the, the comic Oh, script. yeah, totally. Yeah, I think I was thinking about that, and I was like... Was that with you know, Final Fantasy like, characters, I if I do, recall? like, all the Final Fantasy yeah. characters. Yeah! And that's where we started. And I was a big Final Fantasy fan, and I loved, like, 4 and 6. I, you know, the best games really in the series, more. we can just accept. Oh, yes, absolutely. But 4 and 6 and the honorary Chrono Trigger Yeah. Okay. Okay. the best ones in the series. All right, um, so I'm fine with you using all the, the yeah. retro stuff at this point because you said c- Chrono Trigger, so you have my heart. Right. And, uh... <laughs> we, uh, you know, if you look at the game itself, we've put little you know in-jokes and references to some of this stuff into the game. Um, so like the wizard's uh, ultimate ability, it's called Meteo. Oh, and okay, there not, you go. Not that's, Meteor. That's perfect. Not Meteor, Meteo. <laughs> um, okay. And you know, does fans it kill of Final you? Fantasy does 4. it kill you to cast like Tella? <laughs> it does not, but it kills just about everything else. Perfect, perfect. But that would be a nice touch. But no, no, it is. It's very and the every hero has sort of a passive ability, like they often do in the mobas. Uh-huh. Uh, our bard. Uh, I give you one guess what the bard's passive ability is called. Is it something to do with being a spoony bard? It certainly is. Good job. <laughs> Yeah, we're kind of in the a golden age of not just board games, but also retro throwbacks in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I think there's some pushback on that because people assume that uh, retro stuff is just a, a way to cheaply cash in on nostalgia. But there's mm-hmm. also a way to be reverent and, and have respect for the art form and, and integrity of the, the original medium in the first place. And it definitely sounds like that's what you're trying to go for here which I absolutely love. Right. I mean, we 
we're definitely trying to be in that latter camp where we want to we want this to be an homage to those uh, older games. I thought you were going to say Undertale, by the way. But, oh well, um, okay. Well, <laughs> Undertale is is a whole nother thing. That, it's its uh, own thing. Yeah, Undertale <laughs> yeah, right. is. We could just create an Undertale podcast here. Stop this whole thing. Stop the cardboard herald, and we could just try and dissect undertale because i'm not even sure how to approach describing that for someone who's yeah. never played it before and maybe the best way is saying i shouldn't describe it and you should just go play that's, undertale that's probably true they uh, the listener that hasn't heard of undertale you should play undertale like i said i grew up with this stuff and it resonates with me and i have a feeling it's gonna resonate with a lot of other people too well, what's this going to mean once it actually comes to fruition? I'm crossing my fingers for you. I feel like you guys are going to really kick butt at this next Kickstarter. And I want to see what the future has for all of you. But this has been a big part of your life up to this point. So let's say this does uh, fund. It becomes successful. It actually gets delivered. And someone out there, some random listener to this podcast has a copy of Battle for Baterni in their hand. What does that mean to you? Well, I mean, that's uh, that would be just amazing because it's already amazing to go to conventions and stuff and meet people that played it before, like last year when we were there, and say, oh, man, I couldn't wait to play this. And I took it to Gen Con and... I ran a few sessions of it, and all but a couple of them filled up really quickly, which was super exciting. And some of the people that that played were former backers, and others were people just checking it out. And I think a lot of people really enjoyed it, and that was really rewarding for me to see. But as far as what the future holds, um, you know, it's hard to say. But uh, if we do get, um, you know, get our funding, if we do blow this out of the water, if it's successful enough that we can keep going. I mean, one of the th- great things about this game is there's always room to make more characters, more heroes, more maps, more stuff that, um, you know, there's some games that just take expansions better than others. And I think this is one that's really expansion compatible. So we've got a lot of a lot of cool ideas waiting if, if we get the chance. But beyond that, you know, Stone Circle Games, uh, we've got several other great designers um well, so there's John, and then there's you know Aaron and Will both have games that they've been working on, and I'm also really excited to you know give people a chance to see some of their stuff uh, come out, and so I hope we succeed for both of those reasons. Well, I can't wait to see the Kickstarter. The game is Battle for Baternia. Uh, does it have a BGG listing right now? Sure does. Um, it definitely does, and you know if if you guys are interested in it, there's not a whole ton of stuff there, but if you post questions there. Uh, or, or comments or anything like that, uh, we, we do check it. So we'll be glad to talk with you on there. Um, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, all that good stuff as well. Well, listeners, as we approach October, because this podcast will probably go up uh, a little bit later, I'll make sure in the outro to have the exact location where you can find all kinds of information for Battle for Baternia, uh, so that way you can prepare for the imminent second Kickstarter of Battle for Baternia by Chris Falkenberry of Stone Circle Games. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Chris. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to the Cardboard Herald, your number one source for interviews with creative gamers and game creators on the internet. Your number one source of Jack Eddie on the internet. But there are all kinds of other sources for great board game content on the internet, and it's up to you to go out there and find it. If you need a recommendation, I'd say check out these Stone Circle Game Guys. They have awesome video reviews with really great production values. Like if you're wanting some YouTube reviews that aren't ours because we're doing all kinds of YouTube stuff and you should go check that out anyway, uh, then I recommend check out Stone Circle Games reviews or Behind the Box because Behind the Box is a couple. They make awesome 
reviews and they have charming interactions with each other and they're just such a cute couple that you should you can find all this stuff on the internet but the one thing if you can do anything is to to set yourself a reminder to check out the Battle for Baternia Kickstarter that launches on November 7th. This is a very cool game with clearly an incredibly cool designer who has exquisite tastes in Final Fantasy and Chrono Trigger-ish video games from the 90s that just make me so happy. And from everything that I can tell, it looks like a killer game to boot. So check out Battle for Paternia. The Kickstarter is launching on November 7th. I hope to have a review of the game, a video review on our YouTube channel up during the Kickstarter at some point, crossing my fingers that they can pull that together. So look out for that. Look out for all the stuff. And I hope you guys have an awesome week. And I'll talk to you through all the various mediums that the Cardboard Herald reaches to you. So thank you so much. And you keep on gaming.